I have a, just a couple of questions I want to ask, but I want you sure. to answer as take as much time as you'd like to. So <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to say that. No, I do. Cause I remember your classes and I remember, um, I remember the way that you told the story of, uh, Christian history and church history was always something that I felt um, it made sense as a narrative. And so I, I grew up as an evangelical kid and you know that we don't do church history on the local <laughs> church level. We kind well, of see like there was Jesus and there was Paul and there were evangelicals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like the, there was 2000 years is nothing. It was, it's a thousand years is a day for the Lord. So it was two days ago and we're just doing exactly what the book of Acts says. That's, that's right. Um, that's right. But if, if we had any sort of like uh, American church history, most of us were told that the pilgrims came to America looking for religious freedom. And that they were good, hardworking, mild-mannered, Bible-believing people, like Superman's parents out on the farm in Kansas. And that those people believed in freedom, equality, and respect for all people, and that Jesus was for everybody. And that evangelicals and kind of Protestants today reflect those same kind of like American Christian values. But over the last 15 years, and I've had a lot of our students have asked me, like, what happened? Because I think that, you know, I also have friends from overseas. They look at American evangelicals as people who are Islamophobic and homophobic and xenophobic. And I'd like to, I'd like to maybe push back on that a little bit. But I remember during the 2016 election, not to pick on any candidate specifically, but the content of speeches which were you know islamophobic and xenophobic and homophobic they got standing ovations from evangelical people when there were conferences together and i remember being very bothered by that and since then i've seen you know my brothers and sisters in the evangelical world make endless excuses for religious and political leaders who have committed like very deep moral failures just because those religious leaders kind of agree with our, a couple of like evangelicalism sort of core beliefs or what we think we're supposed to believe. Then we make all kinds of excuses for immoral behavior. And then I've also seen us demonize all kinds of people that aren't like us by calling them socialists and communists and pedophiles and anti-American and anti-Christian. And I've seen the church basically refuse to deal with social issues and kind of stick to this like hyper reformed idea that salvation is just like a personal thing and that it has no societal consequences. But at the same time, there's like flags on the stage behind the pulpit when our pastors preach and there's, they, they try to push the Bible into like Congress as much as possible. And, and we're doing a lot of lip service to the Bible and to like values and things that sound sort of vaguely religious. Um, and so the, the question that I and a lot of younger evangelicals or people who are raised evangelical would have is how did we get here from what we understand is like kind of like our idealistic Christian beginnings to a form of the faith that denies even what we think about ourselves as we're doing it. Does that make sense? Like we're, we're so far removed from what we think we are and yet we're doing that at full speed and with as much energy as possible. And so I, I would really like to know how you think we got here just sort of from, from colonial days to now. And I know that the colonial thing is the, the version we were told is almost pure fantasy, but go ahead. Oh gosh. Well, <laughs> John, uh, wow, that was a loaded question. So, you know, I, I think the first thing, maybe the, the initial response that I want to make to um, your observations is, um, you know, you're right. There is, I think, um, a, a bit of a misunderstanding about how Christianity, the, the Puritan heritage of, of the of American Christianity. Um, you know, it's interesting. I spent last spring over in London, and um, 
they have a very different take on the Puritans. I, I visited a lot of, um, of cathedrals over there and inevitably at one point in the tour, the tour guide would take us over to some section of the cathedral where we would see, you know, a statue with the head chopped off or some kind of artwork where all the faces have been scratched out, you know. And, and then the, the, um, the guide would look at us and just go, Cromwell. You know? <laughs> and so, um, and you know, for those who may not know who Cromwell was, he was this Puritan leader um, during what was known as the Interregnum where there was no king, you know, there was no king or queen in England. And uh, he led a, a, a Puritan-led parliament that was very violent, uh, plunged uh, England into a civil war, uh, one of the worst that, that they had ever experienced. And, uh, you know, a lot of his followers uh, went through cathedrals and churches and just destroyed a, a bunch of artwork, considering it to be idolatrous. And so, you know, that kind of set up then uh, after the interregnum, this pushback against the Puritans because uh, just the devastation that they caused over in, in England because of their politics and, and their religious zealotry. So, um, you know, a lot of Puritans and, and then more extreme Puritans who were the separatists um, found it very uncomfortable to live in England because they were being thrown in jail and kind of getting a little bit uh, back what they had dished out back when they were uh, in power. And so they were looking for a place for religious freedom and they saw it over in the colony. And so you're right, we do have this sort of romantic view of these leaders who came over, these separatists and Puritans who came over. Uh, Puritans set up this, uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But one of the things that uh, a lot of people don't realize is though they were seeking religious freedom, um, <laughs> A part of the oppression that they were getting was kind of deserved because of the oppression that they caused when they were in power. Um, and, you know, and the, I mean, countless number of people that they not only imprisoned, but tortured and killed. Uh, it, was, it was really tragic, especially what they did over in Ireland. Um, when I was visiting Ireland, I remember one uh, guy, it was a small sort of medieval Irish town, taking us to this. Um, Basically, all, it was rubble is all it was. It was a little foundation rubble. And uh, she said, you know, when Cromwell came to town uh, with his army, uh, a bunch of uh, the, the men decided to hide the men and the women, or the women and the children in this building to try to keep them safe because uh, it was just, it was like genocide when these armies would come through. And uh, when Cromwell's army found out that these women and children were in the room, or in this building, they set fire to it. and, and, and killed all the women and children inside. I mean, there's atrocities like that, that the pure, and these are Puritans doing all this, right? That um, still over in, in England, you know, when they think of Puritans, they, that's what they think of. They, they think of these genocidal, um, you know, uh, extremists. So they're kind of glad to get rid of them when they came over to, to our, our world. So, you know, when the Puritans came over here, they, they were looking for religious freedom, but they're only looking for religious freedom for themselves. Um, they, they set up the same kind of autocracy uh, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, that they had attempted mm -hmm. to do over in England under, under Cromwell. Now, it didn't last long, you know, it lasted about 50 years or so, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But during that time, there very much was sort of this... Um, Theocracy is probably a better word for it that they set up. And it was very intolerant. Um, you can read uh, again of some uh, atrocities that were committed against uh, Quakers, for example, who were uh, imprisoned and, and even executed. Um, yeah. And then even Baptists, there's um, uh, one of the things that will incite Baptists to get very passionate about religious liberty is um, Baptists being imprisoned and, and whipped, and then uh, later having uh, Baptist churches uh, fined or taxed uh, simply because they weren't a, a Puritan or a Congregationalist church. Yeah. Um, and um, 
there was a one one guy in particular by the name of Isaac Bacchus, who uh, was a Baptist in in Massachusetts, who uh, really um, got it pretty um, what's the word passionate about religious liberty when uh, his mother, who was uh, reading her Bible by the um, by the fireside, according to the story, um, when you know basically the uh, the, the police uh, came in, arrested her, threw her in jail because she was a dissenter, a Baptist, and she hadn't paid her fine or her taxes or something like that. And, uh, and she was an elderly woman and not very healthy, but she, you know, she wrote letters to Bacchus, sort of seeing her, her plight as um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, yeah. <laughs> that kind of, she saw, she saw herself in, in that kind of a, of a, of a narrative. And, and so Bacchus really got inflamed about all of this. And so he fought hard for religious liberty. So Bacchus is one guy, John Leland is probably another champion. So, you know, we Baptists have this heritage of, of champions for religious liberty. Um, but not just religious liberty, liberty for ourselves, we wanted religious liberty for everybody. There, there's a famous quote from Leland, and I'll paraphrase it a little bit, but basically he said um, that the, the role of government is to ensure that, you know, people can believe whatever they want, whether they believe in one God, three gods, 20 gods, or no God. And, uh, which is a really radical view for the time that, that I, you know, I, I can't. Today, that may not sound all that radical, but back in its day, that was, that was very extreme. Uh, I think, it's, I think it's probably becoming radical again, though. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting because I just read this this morning, I read another story in, in the New York Times about uh, Christian nationalism and, and how that's really sort of a big, big push right now. And, and one of the reasons why, um, you know, Trump was was supported by I think still eighty percent of evangelicals or something yeah. like that, um, and it was because of this this desire to see Christian nationalism um, become a thing. But you know, as I've already said, uh, that was something that we Baptists opposed. Um, yeah, at least as part of our heritage, we we felt like that people that that if, if government could create an environment where it's um where, where truth was just given an opportunity you know where, where truth um about christ um was was given um uh, a space where people could freely hear it that it would prevail you know that truth would the truth about christ would prevail because they were so convinced that if you match the truth about Christ up with all the other truths that are out there, that it would rise to the top. And, and, and that this is the way of, of convincing society about the gospel. It, 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 it's done in, in a way where um, there, there, there is no monopoly on the truth, as, as, as had been the case for most of human history. Um, and so that's why we were so excited about it, is, is, is we felt like, you know, truth will find a way. Just be patient, but but you know, eventually, if you just put it out there, people will embrace it because it is the truth. You know, for, for those, the for those early, um, those early Baptists and maybe non-Puritan Christians, what was the truth about Christ? Because I know that that essential message has kind of adapted, and especially going through like the two awakenings, the two great awakenings, mm -hmm. as they're called, um, the message wasn't necessarily consistent from time to time and so those those early people what 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 was the truth that they thought would rise to the top if they were given yeah well it was very pietistic and, and so um in, in that respect uh, truth was truth was jesus yeah if, if you want a short answer that that would have been their answer the truth is jesus right and you know we baptists were very anti-credal to that end and, and so you know the big cry was no no creed but the new testament and so we were you know if you want to if you want to look at our creed and read the new testament that's our creed yeah and so you know it, you're right there was there was a there was a, uh, a very broad umbrella you might say um 
that would have been uh, allowed. And, um, and so, but I, I would say uh, the, the more the, the pietistic tradition would have been a part of this. So, you know, an emphasis upon relationship with Jesus, yeah. um, emphasis upon more what we might call Christian mysticism, yeah. uh, where uh, you're, you're emphasizing emotion as, as much or more emotion and, and, and practice uh, more than doctrine. Now, you know, just if you want to know doctrinally kind of what the general or more the more popular understanding was, it was pretty Calvinistic at that point. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I call them bad Calvinists. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that they weren't um, uh, too, they, you know, they, they, they weren't really interested in getting into a theological fight with you. Uh, they were they're far more interested in have you experienced Christ, have, you know, have you experienced the conviction of the Holy Spirit mm. that has led you to um, uh, to follow Jesus? You know, they, they were far more interested in having a conversation with you about that than they were whether or not, you know, you affirm the depravity of man or something. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um. So you ask, you know, so what, what, you know, how did we get to today? Yeah. And, and, and so I, I guess I wanted to start off with, with where we were and, and, and sort of try to put a better understanding on, on where we were, um, at least as Baptist. And I'm try, trying to narrow it down perhaps to yeah. more that tradition. Well, I mean, I think that's fair because the, still the biggest denominations in the country are Baptist. And yeah, um, yeah. especially when it comes to like the attempted political influence, a lot of it is coming from. Baptist corners. You know, I, I, th I think in our neck of the woods, we would like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the truth of the matter is, Baptists have been on a decline for, for many decades. Yeah. Um, and and I think you know a part of the reason why we are seeing, uh, and, and let me also mention, John, we Baptists resisted the label evangelical. Uh, we we did not see ourselves as a part of that movement uh, up mm. until about the seventies or eighties. And, and that's when things began to change um, yeah. with, um, you know, so it all starts with uh, what, what is sort of known as the conservative resurgence. Um, and uh, what, what becomes the catalyst for this in, in the 1960s was a fight over uh, a Broadman commentary uh, published a, a commentary series and, and on um, Genesis, um, the commentary on Genesis, the author um, used uh, the JEDP theory, uh, mm -hmm. documentary hypothesis theory, um, uh, in order to interpret, interpret uh, Genesis, which at the time was considered, you know, liberal. You know, today, to be honest, I think most Baptist Old Testament scholars today would affirm um, JEDP, but um, yeah, back then it was, it was considered liberal. And so it, it, that sort of became the, the catalyst that started this discussion about have we Baptists become too liberal? And there were a lot of uh, pastors, among them W.A. Criswell, um, who would answer that question, yes. And so that sort of started this, this grassroots movement that joined the broader, uh, what I call neo uh, evangelical or neo fundamentalist uh, movement that comes out of Wheaton, and uh, and it's not just theological; it's political, and, and so it sort of morphs into the the um, uh, moral majority uh, movement of, of Falwell, and then um, you know then, then that sort of morphs into uh, some other expressions in, in the eighties and the nineties. So I think that's when all of this sort of starts to come together. Then where we have Baptist uh, leaders who felt like the domination become too liberal are, are joining these other evangelical leaders out there. And, and even, you know, interestingly enough, Catholics started uh, to join um, this, this movement as well. And, and, and when that happens, we start to shift the conversation from theology to uh, hot button cultural issues, um, in particular, abortion, uh, LGBTQ, um, uh, rights and those uh, those I think would be the two you could probably maybe add you know Second Amendment military spending 
you know, some some other uh, things uh, along with that. But but yeah. this then becomes the litmus test for whether or not you are a Christian. You know, what do you think about a, the abortion issue? What do you think about the gay issue? That that becomes the litmus test for whether or not uh, you are, are are on our side. And if you're not on our side, then and so it was really interesting in the fifties and the sixties. You know, most Protestants thought the Catholics were all going to hell, and then in the seventies. Uh, when the Catholics said, you know, we're, we're anti-abortion too, um, then all of a sudden said, oh, well, Catholics are Christians. <laughs> so come join us in, in this fight against, you know, the bad guys out there. And so, you know, it's really interesting that that took place. And then, you know, more recently with Mitt Romney, um, um, his, his rise in, in all of this, um, when he was running uh, for president, now all of a sudden, um, Mormons were Christians too because they agreed with us on, on, on these issues. And I remember just being sort of uh, uh, floored when, um, when I think, was it Billy Graham or, or maybe both Billy Graham and uh, his son came out and said that Mormons are, are Christians um, during the election cycle. That sounds like a, a Franklin quote. If, yeah, but I think Billy uh, backed them up too. I think yeah. both of them did, and which you know really now you know it didn't really surprise me that Billy did because he's always been quite ecumenical. I mean, he yeah. was he he'd sort of embraced uh, Catholics long before uh, others did, and not just because of the social issue. I think you know Billy Graham was just far more ecumenical. But, you know, Franklin, I think his motivation was was more narrow in yeah. that they're against abortion, they're against gays, so they're Christian. Um, and so you really see that with him. So, you know, which really surprised me because back when I was in the 70s in the 80s, in the 1980s, back when I was in seminary, rather, back in the, in the 1980s, and there's actually a, a, a course you could take on cults and, and Mormons were, <laughs> mm. <laughs> they were front and center in that, in that class as being considered a cult. Yeah. Uh, but now what defines us is, is um, these, these more cultural issues. Yeah. In theology. So, um, so that's when I think we begin to see this shift, the 70s and, 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 and 80s, um, when we begin to redefine Christianity, uh, not so much on theological terms, but on, on social, hot button, political terms. Do you think that, so one of the things that really stuck with me from your class uh, when I took it was your breakdown of the two awakenings in mm. the late 1700s and then the mid 1800s right um and what i remember from please please correct me because i this is one of those things that keeps finding its way into my sermons but i need to make sure that i'm right um the the first great awakening from what i understand was a little bit more intellectual and they felt like they needed to teach people how to read so that they could read scripture. And then there was doctrinal and theological training that went along with that. But that sort of by default excluded a lot of people who were alive at that time who were illiterate and unable to devote any time to learning to read and then learning the Bible. And it was a slow process. Um, but then the second great awakening was more of an emotional movement. It was more of a charismatic movement and the, sort of the tent revival and the feeling called by the Holy Spirit and um, the emotionalism actually was something that a lot of illiterate and even sort of like subclass people like slaves were invited to participate in. And from just kind of trying to put the pieces of how America was churched together for myself, it seems like most of the churching of america that went on kind of pushing west during westward expansion was done by people who had felt called to ministry at a revivalist meeting but didn't necessarily have any theological training and had not been taught to think through doctrinal issues and to interpret scripture and the from i i'm i get the sense when i read that period of american history that um, maybe some of our like anti-intellectualist tendencies, especially what came out after Darwin published The Origin of Species, 
was because not just because people were committed to a literal reading of scripture because they'd weighed all the options and that was what they landed on, but more because they didn't know how to read scripture other ways. And Mm -hmm. they, you know, we had just sort of, a a lot of people just sort of like pushed out into the frontiers and started Mm -hmm. churches with the Bible as their guide, but they weren't, there, there was no, they had no training in nuance interpretation. And so when the demands of maybe the 20th century came along for nuanced interpretation uh, with scientific discovery and especially like the world wars and things that happened in Europe, we just weren't intellectually prepared. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. Um, I, well, I think what you are uh, observing is that there's always been this sort of anti-intellectual strain in American Christianity. And, and I would agree with that. Uh, I think, um, I think coming out of, of both awakenings, uh, but certainly second awakening uh, and the um, and the, the camp meetings that you had uh, alluded to were a big part of that because I think they did appeal to the more anti-intellectual strain mm. that, that you find in American Christianity. For Baptists, this comes out of what's known as the Sandy Creek tradition of right. uh, Shubel Stearns and Daniel Marshall, uh, who are also uh, quite uh, anti-intellectual and, and we Baptists resisted for the longest time education because we felt like or at least that tradition did now there's the Charleston tr- tradition did not but the Sandy Creek tradition resisted for the longest time uh, getting educated because we felt like it, it would ruin you mm. uh, um, and and so we we didn't even start uh, Baptist universities until the 19th century mm. uh, for the most part now again the Charleston tradition is a whole different animal but the, yeah. the, the Sandy Creek tradition resisted it for, for the longest time and it wasn't until you know what mid um, mid 19th century or so until baptists actually had their first seminary mm. uh, southern seminary because they didn't feel like it was needed yeah yeah well and that it would ruin you you know yeah uh, because because if, uh, all you needed to be able to do is to read the bible and and all you needed to be able to to have in order to, to preach the only credential that you really needed to be a, a baptist minister was a calling yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, you express to a church, I feel called to the ministry next, next Sunday, you might get ordained. And then the following Sunday, they might take up a love offering for you and say, okay, go plant a church. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which yeah. is why there's a Baptist church on pretty much every street corner in the South. Uh, because that's, that's well, that was our approach. Um, and we felt like a seminary got in the way. Now that's going to change. Um, and uh, in the middle of the 19th century, when we have our first seminary, and then you know subsequent seminaries uh, follow through. So I think, but I think there are many layers to your observation, and one of them was the the modernist fundamentalist um, uh, controversy that, um, that that took place at the early part of the 20th century. Scopes monkey trial, perhaps being the more um, um, I think people are, are more aware of, of the Scopes Monkey Trials uh, yeah. part of that. Um, but it, it still um, created, um, or, or I, I should say, um, the Scopes Monkey Trial put a spotlight on, on, on this thing that you're noticing, which is, and you know, there are many layers to it, John. I mean, there's, yeah, I there's education, there's, there's uh, anti-education, there's East and West, there's urban, there's city, um, I'm sorry, urban and rural. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I need my second cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> no, and so, definitely there's, there's North and South too, right? There's North and yeah. South. You know, so there, there are many layers uh, to it. So it's, 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 it's very, but, um, you know, suffice it to say, it's, it's always been there. And then, it, and then uh, what, what happens is certain movements then uh, attract it and, uh, and magnify it. And, and I think that's one of the things that we're seeing today. You know, interestingly enough, Mark Knoll, and you may remember this from class, but Mark Knoll noticed this way back in the 80s. Yeah. Uh, Mark Knoll being a church historian. And um, he wrote a book called The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind, where he, he pointed out, you know, this anti-intellectual strain. If, if we don't do something ab- about it soon, it is going to 
grow and, and become a very real problem for evangelicals. And boy, was he prophetic yeah. uh, in, in noticing that. And, um, and I think that's, that's what we're, we're, we're facing today is that um, this idea that education ruins you, that in particular seminary education will destroy your faith is is quite um quite popular today and um and, and i think is, is giving rise to some um well ju- we'll just say some some very real problems for us that um it'll be interesting to see where all this leads and and i know i'm a little worried about it not just a, i'm a lot worried about it yeah and, and i don't know where it's all gonna take us hmm. Um, I hope I'm hitting on some of the stuff. No, you want. Um, yeah, no, you definitely are. Um, do you think that what we're seeing, it, here's another loaded question. So uh, when you read church history, even starting with the book of Acts all the way up to the present, Every generation seems to lose track of Jesus mm-hmm. and what they're trying to do institutionally. And so um, why do you think that is? Was he just so far ahead of us when it comes to just sort of the, the kind of human life that he called us to live that it's easy for us to kind of snap back into human defaults? And is what's happening in American Christianity just sort of us returning to like maybe some of our cognitive defaults or is there something like on a spiritual level that's happening there that, that is even deeper than that? You know, I think it's, I think it's probably um, natural for any movement or institution to move away from the founder's original vision over time. So I think you see sort of this pattern of, and you see this in church history, of of getting away from the vision of Christ, becoming, Mm. uh, you know, more, whatever word you want to use, worldly, corrupt, Mm. um, exploiting, uh, you know, the people in your your institution. So, you know, you've got that. So you have a series of bad popes who are, yeah. were um, just in it for the prestige, power, money, or whatever. But then, there's, you know, there's, there's a renewal. Typically, in church history, it would have, at least in Western church history, it started in a monastic order uh, where they say, you know, wait a minute here. We, we've gotten quite a ways away from faith that we maybe thought that that was going to protect us uh, from that. Mm. Uh, and I think maybe what we're discovering is that you know, no, American Christianity is falling into the same pattern that the institutional church has, has always been in. And, and uh, we're, we, we take our eye off the ball and, and we begin to see other things as, as more of a priority than feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and, you know, comforting and taking care of the sick and the imprisoned. All the, all the uh, things that Jesus emphasized um, we take our eye off of that and, and other things become a priority for us. And, um, and I, I think we're just maybe waking up to the fact that we're no different and we thought we were, but we're not. And these things didn't protect us. And, and we, we are just as, as blind as, as, as some of those in, in other periods of church history who, who led us astray. But when you say we, you're talking about the 20% of people that are asking the question and not the 80% that are shoveling coal into the steam engine and just going forward as fast as they can. <laughs> well, I, I try not to be dualistic about this, John. I know, you know yeah. I, and, and, and because I think, um, I just think it's a lot more complicated than that, I, you know, 80%, 20%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, and, and this is coming from somebody who is also a, a pastor in two rural churches and, um, and, and, and sort of seeing what, what, what this is doing in, in my own congregation. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so I, I don't, I, I want to refrain from painting this as if there are good guys and there are bad guys. Right. 
Yeah. Um, I, I certainly think that there are some bad guys out there. Don't get me wrong. And, right. and people who I think know better and, um, and, and who are quite, I think, devious and, and exploiting people, that they are out there. And, and, but I, I wouldn't put them in the 80%, I, I no, guess is what right. I'm saying. Um, if, I, if I really thought that 80% of our brothers and sisters were as ill-intentioned maybe as uh, like the non-sympathetic media wanted to paint them, then I wouldn't even care about asking the question. But yeah. I, I don't think that they are. And I don't think that, I, I, I think that the church has kind of landed it itself in a situation that it does not fully understand because we have very little historical context for any of this. Um, we've just kind of decided that we don't need church history and we don't need uh, to, I don't know, there, there's, there's kind of that that feeling that any kind of self-awareness is the same as second guessing yourself and kind of like questioning your, your salvation and your faith. And, um, that I think is the attitude that concerns me most. The fact that we're not poor in spirit and contrite in heart and able to reflect on the consequences of what we believe and what we teach and what we do, um, because we're busy trying to defend our little corner of influence. Um, but I don't think, that's much more of a like of a pharisaical tendency trying to please god by being perfect and by perfecting our little corner of the world without really thinking through the consequences than mm -hmm. it is like an imperial tendency and i know it's it's kind of stylish right now to to compare like american evangelicalism with the roman empire but i think it aligns far more with like the pharisees that jesus knew than it does with any kind mm -hmm. of like imperialistic instinct um and i have i have nothing but compassion for for the whole church because we're not living up to what we could be right right yeah. um you know one of the exercises that um there's a course that that we teach now that wasn't around were you an undergraduate at Hardin simmons or, or just no i went to howard Payne. okay howard Payne. yeah um one of the core classes that we now make our students uh, take at Hardin Simmons is it's called the, the religious and philosophical life. Mm. And uh, one of the things that I do at, toward the end of the semester is, is I 12 you know, things. Um, and then I'll say, okay, well, from your knowledge of, of just the teachings of Jesus, not nothing else in the Bible, but just the teachings of Jesus. Uh, so I'm talking about those red letter words that you read in the gospels. Yeah. Um, what would you say would be the priorities that, that, that Jesus mentioned? And then, and so they, they say things like, you know, um, loving your neighbor, loving God, feeding the hungry, you know, clothing the naked, and blah, blah, blah. So we'll come up with about another 12 things. And I'll just sort of step back and say, now let's take a look at those two lists. What do you notice? And it's a really eye-opening exercise because... Um, they they begin to see just how far we have strayed from the priorities of Jesus with uh, with the, with the politicizing of of our faith today, and it's not to you know and I will look at them and say it's not to say that you know the the politics you know we need to be concerned about politics we need to be a voice of politics and, I, and i'm not trying to diminish that at all but when when our faith becomes defined by our, our, our politics that's where you know we need to really open our eyes and, and realize hmm maybe maybe we have gotten too far off the path so i think yeah. there are ways of 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 helping people to get back to the tax, like, like yeah. the 16th century reformers, you know, try to get us, let's get back to the text and actually see what the text says, because, you know, so many people have this idea of what the text says, because that's what they've heard. But when you, you know, when you take into the text and say, let's, let's see what it's actually there, then that, that that's an eye opener. And, and then, like you said, I think just um, church history, uh, seeing the patterns in church history on, on this very thing, realizing that this is nothing new. Yeah. This has happened before. And the church has survived. Not only has the, has the church survived, but, you know, typically what happens is out of the ashes of something like this, we get 
uh, a, a new paradigm for doing church that, that is more vibrant, more powerful yeah. uh, than before. So, um, so there's always hope, you know, there's, there's always, right. uh, and I think that's the one thing that church history teaches us is that out of the ashes of, of all of this can arise something quite powerful and beautiful. That, that was, uh, well, okay. That's kind of my last question, but I would, before we do that, um, I, I just kind of reading church history. I, it doesn't seem like we were ever designed to be in charge of people like on a societal level. Um, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to live in post Constantine, uh, in the so you're, you're talking about the church. The, the church was never uh, designed to dominate government. We're Is not. What we're not good at it, and we're not good at at holding on to like a uniquely Christian character and flavor when we try to apply that to sort of systems of governance. So I like I, I always like when I talk about few, this with people. I always say like I wouldn't want to live in post Constantine Christianized Rome. Uh, I definitely wouldn't want to live in Calvin's Geneva. Uh, England under Cromwell seems terrible. Um, and uh, we, I, the genius of the founding fathers and their idea of the separation of church and state seems to be part of the constitution that constitution loving people are, are choosing to ignore at the moment. And there's, uh, there, I think there was a, a senator from Texas who read from Leviticus on the floor of the Senate during the debate over um, marriage equality. And that was, that was praised by a lot of Christians as, you know, we're taking the Bible into Washington, um, not understanding that, like, our entire... In the very Washington, next verse, yes. was, in the very next verse, there was capital punishment for, you know, women pregnant out of wedlock. And, if I remember so. right, that senator had a shaved beard, which you're not supposed to do, and I guarantee... Yep. Bacon for breakfast, and he was wearing like a <laughs> cotton polyester blend. Yeah. We're gonna ignore all those right. other things. <laughs> yeah, he had his highlighter, and he was very specific. Um, and uh, but but again, we we there's this rush, I think, to unite cross and flag by you know a lot of Christian people um, that is very disturbing. And I when I look back at church history and I see those times where that was accomplished, it ended up being a hellhole for a lot of people. And uh, I, you know, maybe if you were John Calvin and you were running Geneva or you were somebody that John Calvin liked, things were going very well for you. But if you were his enemy, then they would kidnap you on the side of the road on your way to debate him and burn out your tongue or whatever they did. And, um, you know, like if you look at, uh, th this is probably a whole other conversation, but if you look at the way that the plantation missions um, tried to enforce the idea of being a good slave onto the slaves by using Christianity as, as sort of a tool of control in the, in the South during slavery. Um, I, I don't think that the principles in Christianity translate well into a system of government. Um, and that might just me be me being like very postmodern about it because I know that, um, just even 20 years ago, the idea of a Christian government was very positive in the minds of a lot of people, but I, I am having a hard time seeing how they would even fit. Yeah, well, and, and I think you're hitting upon something that our Baptist forefathers and foremothers uh, em emphasized as well, that separation of church and state was, was good for both church and state. Um, yeah. That, um, and you know, one of the sort of crude comments that that I, I've made in class is that whenever the church has gotten in bed with the state, we've gotten raped. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and what I mean by that is that um, when the church gives up the spirit as um, the, the foundation for its power in influencing people, then we become impotent. You know, when we think that laws and regulations uh, and, and governments can take the place of, of the Holy Spirit in changing the lives of people, you know, we, we become impotent. Yeah. You know, the real powers of, of the church are spiritual. Right. 
And, um, you know, so it's, it's really a lack of faith that turns to the government to, to change people. And, um, and, and so that's what our Baptist forefathers and foremothers understood, is if you want a powerful church, then get as far away as you possibly can from the government and create a government that protects the church in, in doing so. Um, and, and, and so it, the, the, I would say the converse of that, is, I think, is what you're getting at is, is also true. Um, it, and that is when the, the church controls the government and also weakens the government as well. You know, our, our Baptist forefathers and foremothers understood that the government's role was to basically to create an equal playing field for all religions. Right. And, and, and to protect all religions. Because uh, we Baptists believed that if, if, if that were the case, that, that Christianity um, would, uh, would, would prevail because we, we believe that our understanding of, of God um, and our understanding of a, of a worldview uh, would, would prevail if it was just given a, an equal chance. Yeah. That's a... Uh... Also, Francis Schaeffer's position, if I remember right, from the Christian Manifesto, um, he talks about the the free market. I think that was written in the 80s, but he was talking about the free market of ideas being very favorable to Christianity. But anything that tries to tilt the table in our favor um, actually undermines most of our central teachings about uh, equality and acceptance and a freedom and, yeah. you know, the the personal search for enlightenment and for God. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. So last question then. Um, some, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to interview again because I, I want to talk about slavery in depth because I think that oh, good grief. Okay. we need more white guys talking about it. Um, <laughs> uh, just one of the reasons is when I, like when I moved to Texas, I, I didn't grow up Baptist, but I, all of my higher education is at baptist funded schools um but when i moved here and they were telling me about the split between the northern and the southern baptists mm -hmm. what i was told was that the southern baptists wanted to interpret the bible literally and the northern baptists wanted to interpret it liberally and mm -hmm. it's good to be southern baptist because we take the bible more seriously and i just thought okay whatever and uh in recent reading i've discovered that the issue that the split was over in the mid 1800s or early 1800s was the issue of slavery and what yeah. yeah 1845 and uh whether or not there were any clear verses in the bible that demanded emancipation and abolition of slavery and it was again i we we're, we're so removed from that part of our history that it feels like an oversight, but I also think that um, I think it's irresponsible for us to promote a certain perspective without referring to the historical consequences that it grew that it grew from. Um, but I would I can understand why maybe the Southern Baptist denomination wouldn't want to highlight that but i also think that we can't we can't actually heal that and move on from that and rectify that and repent of that and make amends unless we address those issues hmm. so um my question is if we how, how does it get better what what can we do to dig up those things from the past that we need to dig up that people would rather not look at but also in a way that that reconnects things that have been torn apart and that moves forward into like what you were talking about a more vibrant expression of the faith hmm. um wow well, I, I don't really have an answer for that um you know i'm, I'm trained to look at the past <laughs> right <laughs> i'm not trained to look at the future um, you know, and I, and I think, you know, perhaps a, a better person to ask that question would be somebody like Calvin Kelly, who, who has lived that, 
and um, and has some uh, you know some ideas about what, what needs to happen um, moving forward. Um, I, you know, I would say that as an historian, um, it's and you hinted at this. It's important that we not whitewash our history, and that we own up to it and and repent uh, of of what we need to repent. And and you're absolutely right. Um, though there is a, a charge that it was polity that we split over with respect to the North and, and the South. But when you read uh, the, the transcripts and yeah. all the documents uh, of the time, it's very clear that we split over slavery. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to give you the whole story, but I mean, we'll just leave it at that, that we wanted to, we, we believed in the South that slavery was an institution ordained by God. And, um, and the Northerners were, um, I, you know, I, I want to be careful here because the Northerners were just as racist as the Southerners right. were. Right. You know, it wasn't as if, you know, again, this is good guys, bad guys, no. uh, yeah. because the Northerners were just as racist as, as Southerners. One um, of the things I learned but, recently uh, after having studied George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards for every time I've taken any sort of church history class or read any church history is that they were both slave owners and they both knew that it was wrong, hmm. you know? And so even like these, these, these people that we idolize as, you know, preachers and, and like right. John, Jonathan Edwards son was an abolitionist who went around telling people that slavery was like the ultimate evil and people told him to his face that they'd rather listen to his dad. Hmm. And, and so it's not just a function of the time, but we, like you said, we, we, we tend to whitewash these characters and, right. and just sort of conveniently forget all of the complexity of their life. Right. And, you know, and there are some heroes like John Leland, who I mentioned earlier. Yeah. He was not only for religious liberty, but he was an abolitionist. Too. Yeah. He confronted Thomas Jefferson uh, famously on, on this very issue when he, mm. when he delivered a hunk of cheese, a big old wheel of cheese after Jefferson had been um, inaugurated as president. So um, Leland knocked on the door of the White House and said, you know, Mr. President, uh, we in Virginia wanted to congratulate you on becoming president with this wheel of cheese. <laughs> Apparently it was so ripe, could have walked the last mile to the White House. <laughs> um, and, and then he kind of winked at the president and said, and I want you to know no Federalist cows were used in the making of that cheese. And they both had a good laugh over that. And then Leland leaned in and said, and no slaves were used in the making of this, of this cheese either, Mr. President. Mm. With that somber note, he turned around and walked away. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, you, you, know, so you, you, had, you had Southerners who were abolitionists. Yeah. Uh, so I guess, you know, I'm, I'm trying to say it's not as, as, as cut and dry as we would like to make it. So, you know, acknowledging the sins of our forefathers and foremothers uh, on this issue, I think is what church history teaches us. And then looking, you know, very, with, with open eyes uh, as to Baptist's role, not only with slavery, but with civil rights. You know, we've been very, Baptists in the South, for the most part, have been very reluctant uh, in offering civil rights to, to minorities. Um, exceptions, T.B. Maston being a, a, you know, a yeah. white shining star for us, but for the most part, um, Baptists have been very slow in that. So, um, yeah, I, I think, that's what I can offer is just, you know, let's, let's take a, a, a sober um, look at, uh, at, at our sins and begin with, with repenting there. Now, you know, how do we move away from that? I, I think people like Kelvin Kelly would be a much better person mm. to ask that question. Okay. But for somebody like me, I think what I'm getting is you're, you're advising me to be patient because uh, we've been through situations like this before. And it's, uh, I, when I say me, I mean me and people my age. Um, we've been through well, situations like this before and it's, it's probably not a good plan to just write off 80% of our, our <laughs> brothers and sisters because they, they vote differently than we do or whatever. My, my advice would be, be optimistic, be hopeful. Yeah. Uh, uh, in that uh, we, we've been through things like this before and we have, persevered and not only that but we have uh, 
you know, created a, a new paradigm that has been uh, uh, powerful and, and close to the gospel. So don't don't be cynical. That would be yeah. right. don't be cynical. Um, be hopeful. Be optimistic. And um, Jesus does not give us the option of giving up on the church. Right. So I mean, if you take the words of Jesus seriously, you don't you don't have that option. Yeah. Uh, we have to somehow be a voice in the church that, that leads us to the promised land. Wow. Um, now, uh, just to, I guess, keep going with this for one second. If you, if you're, if you need to go, I understand, but, um, mm -hmm. I, a lot of the movements that revitalized the church in the past were very centralized. So you have like, uh, you know, St. Francis giving up on his whole deal and then going and planting a garden and then a bunch of people gathering around him and, and it becoming the Franciscans. And then that being kind of like a, almost like a proto reformation for the Catholic church, but people were very willing to sort of go find Francis and, and submit to his authority and, and adopt his way of life. Um, and even with things like the the evangelical movement in the 70s and the moral majority in the 80s, people were very comfortable with the idea of a centralized authority. I don't see that anymore in our society. I see that we're, we're all sort of on a journey looking for truth for ourselves and that we're very skeptical and very cynical about any kind of centralizing authority. And so it's hard to imagine what the form of a revitalized faith would look like because we're all, we're all lone rangers out on the prairie riding parallel to each other, but we don't have any sort of desire to, I, I, I was driving by, there's a, there's a huge Baptist church um, in a town near where we live. And it's your classic brick Baptist church with the steeple, you know, like the, the classic Baptist architecture, but it's like, all of the brick Baptist churches that you've ever seen, it's like that just sort of somebody expanded that and like multiplied it by like 16. So it's this mm -hmm. giant monstrous Baptist church with a giant steeple. And I was thinking about how much money and influence it took to actually get that built. And I'm having a hard time imagining that same kind of uh, economic and just sort of community investment happening again even if it's not to fulfill that same church building influence but just to organize new communities and to revitalize the faith i'm having a hard time imagining people buying in to hmm. any kind of organization at that level again well it's de it's definitely going to look different um and, and i think you you've hit upon a problem which is that one of the things that american christianity has from from the great awakenings emphasizes individualism um Mm. which believe it or not is considered to be a very liberal idea from the european standpoint right you know, which, which emphasized uh, community um and and we're going to have to um yeah you know that's one of those things that i think has to change uh, we have to realize that we do have a responsibility of the common good mm. which goes all the way back to you know um the very beginning of uh, genesis you know where Cain asks God, am I my brother's keeper? Um, and, you know, that thread is all throughout the Bible. So that, again, that's nothing new. We, we, I, I think it's human nature to sort of fight against that, that no, I'm, we want to we wanna shirk our responsibility and say, I'm not responsible yeah. for my neighbor. And time and time again, even in, in, in the Bible, we are reminded, no, you know, we are our brother's keeper. We are our sister's keeper, whether we like it or not. Um, and so you know, I think that's one of those things that we're going to have to get back to. Now, that said, it's going to look different from, I think, the way it has in the past. Uh, and, and you're right. I, I don't think there is going to be um, a, a, lot of, a lot of passion for, hey, let's build a, you know, a, a big building. <laughs> um, but I do think your generation gets very passionate and, and is willing to contribute to the common good for, you know, let's... Um, Let's end um, sexual slavery. You know, let's um, let's uh, let's end um, poverty in our city, hmm. uh, or let's let's end hunger in our city. You know, I, I think your your generation is very passionate of, of, about things like that. So it may be that we don't need the buildings. 
but we do need the community. And, yeah. and, and so, um, you know, what may happen is it just looks different. But one of the things I'm going to be real curious about is what the church looks like after the pandemic. Yeah. Because so many of us have had to put, uh, you know, have, we've, we've needed an online presence. Right. And my guess is that that has created for the church sort of a catalyst that has jump-started something that was going to be an, an inevitability for us. So that we may even have to redefine what, what community means. Yeah. Um, so that it's not necessarily local anymore. Uh, community now is, is uh, being a part of an online presence that is global. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is, there's some interesting developments there that, you know, my generation, or at least I'm a bit uncomfortable with, you know, right. <laughs> I want, I want to see somebody face to face to, to relate to them, but your generation doesn't. And, you know, and so I have to acknowledge that maybe community is going to be redefined moving forward and, and, and looks yeah. quite different. Part of that's did exciting. Did I answer your question? I'm no, you did. Sure was <laughs> no that that was very helpful and part of that is exciting i for the last uh I, I ended up as a pastor at a church that has um normal church problems just at a degree that a lot of normal churches don't and you know just as a young person a young pastor trying to figure out how to put all the pieces together in a way where we're still faithful to our calling I've been saying for like six years, um, the building is a distraction and our real estate is our idol. And it would be awesome if we could, we live in a place where we live in the Valley here where the weather is very nice all the time. It's like, we can do this outside. We can do this outside. And every time I brought that up, it was like, no, what about mosquitoes? And what about the kids program? And what about the air conditioning? And it was like, look, it's nice outside. Just get used to it. And then now with, uh, with COVID, I finally got what I wanted. I have, we, we meet on Saturday nights outside the church. Everybody wears a mask yeah. separated by six feet. People bring their kids. The kids are just happy to be around other people because they don't have the same access to other people that they used to have. And mm -hmm. they're just sitting there and we're all singing together and stuff, just separated and together. And uh, I'm hoping that by going through this and adapting to this, we, we come up with some new ideas for what we can be and what we can do that's not so institution dependent. Mm -hmm. um, because the, you know, going back to giant church building projects is not what I want. Um, right. Because, you know, as, as soon as you tie yourself to, to material possessions that way, then that becomes the focus of your organization. I don't see any way around that. And I've, I've never been part of an organization that was able to, to keep their altruistic motives in mind and still maintain real estate. And uh, so I hope that, that you're right. I hope that what those, what pastors in those giant churches have been preaching for a long time, that the church isn't confined by these four walls. The church is the people and the church is our community. I hope that we actually mean it from now on. And I hope that, yeah. I hope that we learn that lesson and that becomes an avenue of growth. What that looks like is, is I think it's scary to a lot of people because it's easier to control people when you have a set time and a place where you meet and, um, and I don't mean control. I just mean manage. Um, and so we're going to have to let go a little bit of those, uh, of those, uh, I don't know, those desires and those, those leashes that we have people tied to, um, and let people do their faith out in the wild. And mm -hmm. I think there's a place for the church to empower people to go out into the wild and to be Christians without that artificial structure, but it's a huge shift. And it's, I, I it's probably going to take longer than my lifetime, I think, for us to really see what mm. this ends up as. That's, I, things are moving fast, but, but people are still people. And I don't think a big shift like the internet is something that just is over with in a decade. I think it's something that... Yeah, and you know, traditional ways will, will still be around too. You know, after the 16th century Reformation, the Catholic Church survived. I mean, it's, like, right. it's not like the Catholic Church went anywhere after the Reformation. We just had a, a, another expression of Christianity. And, and, and so uh, I, I don't see, you know, traditional buildings, brick and mortar churches right. going away. Um, but you're, you're right. I think, you know, maybe this new 
um, expression of Christianity becomes more the, of the dominant form uh, moving forward. Which, you know, interestingly enough, is just getting us back to the, to the Jesus movement. Yeah. Um, when, when I first, uh, when, after Texas was locked down, we did, uh, I, I put services up online. And my first comment was, you know, this actually is sort of getting us back to our roots. Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, you know, originally Christians met in homes. Right. Um, and, and in small groups. And um, it was very decentralized. Um, and um, we're, just think of this as experiencing what life was like back in the first century. So my, my we, dad said once that no matter how relevant your church is or how big the organization is, someone always sings a song, someone always picks up money, and someone always reads the Bible and tells you what they think about it. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. That's it right there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Dr. Piggott. Well, uh, thank you so much for talking yeah. to me. Um, yeah. This is your book, From Eden to yeah. Heaven. Yeah. I bought this, uh, I think, right after you published it. I, I pre-ordered okay. it from Amazon. Wonderful. So, uh, thank you. I will, I will plug this to whatever audience I have. Um, <laughs> the subtitle is Spiritual Formation for the Adventurous. And uh, I... Some of your stories in here were were very good, and I I, Thanks. I appreciate your your voice as a writer, and I appreciate you talking to me about these things. Thank you, John. I appreciate that very much. Yeah, I hope good to talk, talk to you again. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>